Go ahead. Um, sorry. Um, should that first temperature be T1 and not T2? Uh, yeah, it looks oh, like uh, we are. It should be T1 here. Yeah, so it's correct okay. in the table. You're right, but incorrect on the handout. Good eye. All right. I'm just curious. Thank you. Yep, no problem. So if you would like to follow along with the example again, you're welcome to bring up that uh, that sheet before. And I mean, just in general, I, I'll always make the announcement, I guess, before the class. But I mean, I will post these starter sheets online. So if you want to pick them out beforehand, I don't know how many people have access to printers, but if you do, you're certainly welcome to print them out before as well. So we've been talking about delta u and how to find delta u for different types of materials so today we're going to talk about um, compressibility for ideal gases so last class we talked about specific heat and how we deal with um, incompressible materials so today we're going to talk about compressibility right so so what happens when things are under pressure right so maybe some people saw the movie this is a little old even for me so um i guess when i was a teenager you know this was sort of uh the style not that i ever dressed like this, right? But it took me a little while to figure out that uh, Vanilla Ice just ripped off uh, Freddie Mercury and friends here. So we're gonna talk about what do we do with ideal gases, right? And compressibility, so things that are under pressure. We know that we've been talking about closed systems and conservation of energy, right? Particularly, you know, a lot of times we've been talking about boiling water, right, to get um, energy right? And how do we conserve water when we do that? Or how do we conserve energy when we do that? But this class is a little different, right? So we've been talking a lot about boiling water, but it turns out that a lot of heat engines work with a working fluid that isn't water, right? So hopefully this is not a surprise to anybody, right? So we've uh, probably all uh, driven or been driven in an automobile where the working fluid is not just air, right? So air in some, you know, air fluid mixture, right? But in this class, when we talk about uh, internal combustion engines, we will assume that the working fluid is air, but also in things like natural gas power plants, we have a similar thing where the, the working fluid looks a lot more like air than water, right? And we can still use conservation of energy if our system is closed, we can still use this same equation here. Notice, here, I didn't write it down, but to get to this equation, we've already assumed a couple things. The first is that the system is closed, because if it's not a closed system, I can't use this equation. And the second is that we're neglecting changes in kinetic or potential energy. So we're saying that the change in energy is mostly determined by the change in this internal energy. We know how to find work in this equation. We're learning different ways to find the change in the internal energy. You won't be able to find Q, you know, at least from first principles, until you take heat transfer, right? So in this class, we're gonna use the first law to find Q more often than not, right? And we can do that if we have a relationship between P and V, and if we can find the change in the specific internal energy, right? So we've been working on that. If it's two phase, we know that we can look uh, on tables A2 and A3. It's under the vapor dome. We're looking for quality. If it's a subcooled liquid, we could look on table A5, but we know now that A5, the data is pretty sparse in there. So we have now two different things that we can do for subcooled liquids. We can assume that delta U is CV times delta T, or we can assume that the specific internal energy of a subcooled liquid is the same as the specific internal energy of the saturated liquid at the same temperature. We can do that for all properties, not just specific internal energy. And then we know for superheated vapor, we can use table A4, right? So this is in this case, steam. So this is superheated vapor that's still pretty close to the vapor dome. We did an example last class that talked about solids and liquids, things that are incompressible. And we said, well, usually for these incompressible materials, it's not such a bad assumption to say that the specific heats are constant. And if the specific heats are constant, then you can find delta U as CV times delta T and delta H as CP times delta T, 
And the cool thing about these incompressible substances is that CV is equal to CP. So they're basically the same thing. It's really just C. So there's only really one specific heat if you're talking about liquids and if you're talking about solids. So that's nice if we're talking about liquids and solids, but maybe you're asking the question, well, is there kind of a shortcut that we can take if we're above the vapor dome and to the right of the critical point, right? The place that we've been talking about superheated vapor. And today we're going to find out that the answer is sometimes, right? So again, as an engineer, we need to know what are the assumptions that we're making and when can we use specific strategies, right? This class is a lot like, I don't know, uh, sometimes I say this and then I always wonder. So uh, when I was a kid, there was a thing called a choose your own adventure book, right? So you read this book and then you make a choice. You go to a different place in the book, maybe like a, like an interactive comic now, right? So I assume that people still know what books are, right? Um, so these things, right, we, uh, basically every problem is the same problem, right? It's all about conservation of energy, but we're sort of going through this choose your own adventure, right? Or maybe it's like, um, what was that app called? Temple Run, right? Where, you, you know, it just goes on forever and you're constantly making decisions, right? Are you turning left or turning right or are you jumping or whatever, right? And that's what we're doing in thermodynamics is, you know, we're sort of navigating this, uh, this path to get to the end of the problem, but it's ultimately always the same. We're just making different choices, right? So do we always need a table when we're talking about superheated vapors? And I think, you know, it sometimes makes sense to go back to the physics, right? So here, let's imagine a case where we have a piston cylinder assembly that looks like this, right? Now it's a closed system and it's filled with gas, right? Let's pick any gas, let's say air. Right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this piston up and down. Right? And as I do that, we're going to track the specific volume. Although here it's kind of a special specific volume. It's a specific volume, but instead of dividing by mass, we're dividing by moles. Right? So um, my brother's a chemist. Right? Um, so when he talks about how much stuff he has, in a particular, you know, reaction or something, he talks about moles, right? Because he's typically talking about a smaller amount of stuff, right? As a mechanical engineer, though, I'm usually talking about, you know, kilograms or pounds or something because I'm talking about lots of stuff, right? But really, moles and pounds or kilograms, it's all talking about how much stuff do we have, right? So here we're going to start thinking about this in terms of how many moles we have because it's uh well you'll see as it evolves but it starts off a little bit easier if we think about um you know if we're taking these specific values as uh with moles in the in the denominator right so we're going to do this experiment and we're going to repeat it at different temperatures right i just like doing the animation here right so the piston is going up and down right because as it comes down the pressure goes up so what happens to things like specific volume right? And what happens to the temperature, right? So if I keep my temperature constant and I do different temperatures, right? So T1, T2, T3, T4. So, you know, temperature is, is going down here with the number. And I'm going to plot on my x-axis the pressure, right? Because the pressure is going to change as I'm moving my piston up and down. And on my y-axis here, I'm going to plot pressure times this specific volume divided by the temperature. Right? And what happens here is as I increase the temperature, or as I increase the pressure, if I keep the temperature the same, I move along these lines for the different temperatures. Right? And then if I move the piston back up, I'm reducing the pressure and I move back along this line. It's kind of, um, you know, you can go forwards and backwards. Right? I like this animation, so I'm going to do it again. Right? So here, right, we're moving in these lines, you know, we're moving along these lines. Right? Now, when people were doing this experiment, what they found was that if they extrapolated these lines all the way to a pressure of zero, so to a vacuum, right, then what would happen is all these lines would intersect my vertical axis at the same place, right? So you might know this. Uh, this is R bar. This is the universal gas constant. Right, so this is R 
bar is what we're going to call it in this class, right? Now, the cool thing is that you can do this experiment with one gas all at different temperatures. You can do it with different gases all at different temperatures. And this point where it intersects the vertical axis always stays the same. Doesn't matter what temperature, doesn't matter what gas, right? So that's what makes this the universal gas constant because the intersection is the same no matter what gas you have and no matter what temperature you have. So that's kind of cool, right? And then somebody came up with the idea of, well, if this is the case, then why don't we measure on the vertical axis PV divided by RT, right? Our bar T. Because then everything would cross this axis or would intersect this axis at a value of one, right? Because if we divide all these values, all these curves by R bar, then everything here is going to cross at one. Right, so we can think about the universal gas constant in lots of different units, right? So here, these are all in terms of kilojoules of energy per the amount of stuff, in this case, all measured in moles, times degree Kelvin, right? Or absolute temperature, right? So kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin, BTU per pound mole Rankine, or foot pound per pound mole Rankine, right? This is all energy divided by how much stuff multiplied by uh, an absolute temperature, right? And that absolute temperature is in the denominator still, right? So maybe you're thinking like, well, <laughs> why is he talking about all this stuff, right? Why are we, you know, taking our time to do this, right? And it's because, you know, this idea, we can define now this idea of the compressibility factor, right? So we're going to call this capital Z, right? And this is like what I was saying, where if we take, PV over T, and we multiply this by 1 over R bar, then we get this PV bar divided by R bar T bar, or T, sorry, not T bar, right? And this, now all of these lines, no matter what gas, no matter what temperature, always going to intersect at Z equal 1, right? Now, as engineers, again, this is kind of like the, the math my brother would do, right? although he's a biochemist, right? He doesn't do too much math, right? And then, uh, you know, this is what it's funny right so you know i had to take a lot of calculus and stuff like i'm sure you have to take a lot of calculus my brother i think took like basically an uh, introduction to calculus calculus class basically high school math and i think that was the only math that he had to take as a biochemist but then what he knows is that anytime he does an experiment and if the data like looks really really weird and you don't understand it you put it into i don't know have you guys done fourier transforms yet so Fourier transform is you'd like you take a, a time series and you turn it into like the frequency domain. So I don't know, maybe you've done that, maybe you haven't. So my brother knows that anytime you get data that looks like garbage, you put it into uh, a Fourier series and then it makes more sense. So that's that's like the advanced math that that, uh, that he does as a biochemist. He understands a lot of things that I don't understand too. So, you know, that's the that's a good thing, right? So when you're, you know, you're developing a lot of good skills, right? And hopefully you're also developing sort of a, an interesting combination of skills. I think that's one thing that makes us, um, you know, attractive in the job market. But ultimately, all the interesting problems happen at kind of the intersection between between different fields. So it's important um, to be able to have interpersonal skills too, because you're gonna have to do things like work on teams, right? And talk to people who maybe speak a different technical language than you do. So, you know, in my case, it's really nice because I, you know, I work on some biomedical applications and it's nice that my brother's a biochemist because anytime I have a stupid question, um, you know, I've got a safe person that I can ask, right? So he's defining things because he's dealing with chemistry, right? He defines things um, by how many moles there are, right? That's like Avogadro's number of molecules, I think, right? Um, but we talk about like how much mass you have because we're talking about more stuff, right? So it turns out this equation ends up being the same if we start to non-dimensionalize things by or we start to define our specific unit so things like specific volume as um you know volume divided by mass but there's a cost to that too because you notice this is no longer our bar right so the really cool thing about doing this with moles 
right? So using R bar is you have this universal gas constant. Doesn't matter what gas you're using, you always cross the axis in the same place. The benefit of not using moles is that we don't have to calculate how many, uh, how many molecules are in three kilograms of aluminum, right? But the cost to that is then we have to use R here. I guess we're talking about gases, so maybe aluminum is not the best choice, right? So maybe three kilograms of air, right? But the cost of that is that we can't use the universal gas constant anymore. Instead, we have to use the specific gas constant which will change depending on the gas that we're talking about, right? So we could plot that same compressibility curve with Z on the Y axis and the intersection is still one. So Z is dimensionless, right? So I, my guess is probably most of us haven't taken fluid mechanics yet, but one of the things that, that you may know is that people who are say designing airplanes they'll often make scale models. And one of the ways you can figure out what size to make your scale model is you start to look at dimensionless parameters. Um, so things like, you know, we'll talk about a Reynolds number, which, which basically tells you if the fluid over your wing is laminar or turbulent or something like that, right? So you try to scale these things by different dimensionless parameters, right? And the cool thing about this is that if you do it well, we get what we call collapse of the data. So this is our compressibility chart, and we can see that here the data collapses very well. So what that means is that we get the same curves, right, no matter what gas we're using. So this is a really cool because all this data collapses. doesn't matter what gas we're using. We always get the same lines if we have the same variables. But there's some art in crafting these variables correctly. Right, so we know on the vertical axis here, we have this compressibility factor, right? So the pressure times the specific volume. As mechanical engineers, we probably want to define that specific volume by the mass, and then we divide by the specific gas constant multiplied by the temperature. This temperature has to be an absolute temperature. Anytime you see an equation and there's temperature in it, and it's not a temperature difference, the hairs on the back of your neck got to start standing up, right? Your spidey senses got to start tingling. It tells you that this means we're using an absolute temperature where zero is absolute zero. Same thing with pressure. If you see an equation that has pressure in it and it's not delta pressure, then that means it's safer to use absolute pressure. And sometimes you absolutely have to use absolute pressure, right? Because you know, zero is different. You get a, you know, if you talk about temperature, you'll get a very different answer here if you plug in a temperature of zero versus if you plug in a temperature of 273 degrees Kelvin. Right, so there's some other variables on here, right? We've got the reduced pressure and the reduced temperature. So this is for each one of these gases, right? Remember we got, so any gas eventually is going to have a vapor dome. Right? So typically when we talk about gases, so even you know oxygen, there is a vapor dome for oxygen. It's just that you know here on Earth, we're typically really far away from that vapor dome so that oxygen is a gas, right? And it's you know liquid oxygen doesn't occur very naturally here on Earth, right? But it does have a vapor dome, right? So it does still have, remember the tip of the vapor dome on that TV diagram is the critical temperature. Right? Just like the, the tip of that vapor dome on a pressure versus specific volume curve is the critical pressure. So if we want the reduced temperature or the reduced pressure, what we do is we take the actual temperature that we have and we divide it by the critical temperature. Or we take the actual pressure that we have and we divide it by the critical pressure. So when we do this, it's really, really cool because all of these are now dimensionless variables so they all have units that are nothing so all the units cancel out so they're all just fractions right so if you talk about like a dimensionless height that would be like your height divided by i don't know maybe the average height of a human right so maybe you'd be 90 percent of the average height of a human 
or you'd be 105% of the average height of a human, but there's no real units on there because it's dimensionless, right? So here we're doing the same thing. We're, de we're defining these dimensionless variables. And if we do it right, we get this cool collapse of the data where it means that it doesn't matter what gas we're talking about. We get all of these points, right? That are at the same reduced temperature. They all line up. It doesn't matter which gas that I'm using, right? You can see these different gases are defined by different, uh, I guess, pip types or something, right? So different symbols here, but they basically all collapse. And then whoever made this graph drew a line, right? That kind of goes through all those points, right? So some kind of curve fit. We call this similarity um, when all these things collapse. It means that basically we've defined these dimensionless parameters correctly, and we can use the same equation to... Um, to sort of predict the behavior of all of these things, right? So it's really cool, right? The other really cool thing is all of these lines, right? It's kind of this fancy curve, but they all, you can't really tell because there's no zoomed in part here at the reduced pressure equals zero, but all of these lines come back and they intersect one here if the reduced pressure was ever zero. So, what does all this mean? Again, it's kind of why are we talking about this compressibility factor, right? So what's really cool here, right, is if our compressibility factor is one, then pressure times specific volume divided by here, the universal gas constant multiplied by temperature is equal to one, right? Which means that for this case, PV bar is equal to R bar times T. Right, And since Z is also the same um, equation without the bars, if we're talking about mass, then we get PV is equal to RT. Right, You might know this equation as the ideal gas law. Right, So PV is equal to NRT. That's maybe a way that you've talked about this. Right, So here, they took this as just the volume, right? And then that was equal to nRT. N is like the number of moles, right? So then if you took big V divided by the number of moles, you would get V bar, right? So this is the ideal gas law. And it's really cool. In chemistry or maybe in physics, you've talked about it in terms of moles, right? That's how you were measuring how much stuff you had. In our class, in thermodynamics as mechanical engineers, again, we're usually talking about the amount of mass that we have. So we're going to talk about P specific volume, which is now volume over mass, times now the specific gas constant, which is going to be different for every gas, multiplied by T, right? So it's cool because we can use it for things that are not moles, right? Like pounds or kilograms. But there's a price in that we'll have a different gas constant for every different gas, right? The other cool thing, right, is that maybe in science class, like in chemistry or something, you just use this equation because maybe your teacher told you you should use this equation. I mean, that's how it was for me when I was in high school, right? But what we're trying to teach you in this class is that as engineers, we need to know the conditions that we're applying in order to use the different equations that we have. Because we have all these different equations and we don't know when we're allowed to use them. So we can use the ideal gas law when we have an ideal gas. But what does that mean? When do I have an ideal gas? I have an ideal gas when this compressibility factor is equal to, or at least approximately equal to one, right? So here, like I said, this specific gas constant, which will be different for every gas, is equal to the universal gas constant divided by the molar mass of the specific gas that you're talking about. And because different gases have different molar masses, then you're going to have a different value for every different gas right? And this is the ideal gas law. So we have an ideal gas when the compressibility factor approaches one, right? And the cool thing about this, right? So we've been talking about trying to find different properties, right? So, you know, we've been saying, oh, I can fix a state if I knew two independent intensive properties, right? But if I know something is an ideal gas and I know, say, the pressure in the specific volume, then, and I know what gas it is, so I know what R is, then I can find the temperature, right? Or if I know the temperature and the pressure, then I can find the specific volume. These things are sort of, they go together, right? So if I can find two of them, then I can find the other one too, 
right? Because we're fixing states, right? So now I've told you that you can only use this ideal gas law when you have an ideal gas. And you have an ideal gas when this compressibility factor equals one. But what does that mean physically, right? How do I know if the compressibility factor is equal to one, right? I have some equation for it, but the equation's only good if I know what PV and RT are, right? So we've got these kind of heuristics for telling us when we have an ideal gas. So you look at all these graphs, right? And there's two times when we get compressibility factors approximately equal to one, right? So the first time is if our, our reduced pressure, remember pressure divided by critical pressure, is low, right? So if our pressure is much lower than the critical pressure, then what happens is, you know what, it doesn't matter which graph I pick, I get close to PR is equal to zero. So as I get close to PR is equal to zero, I get close to a compressibility factor of one. So that's one case when I can use the ideal gas law. The other case where I can use the ideal gas law, excuse me, the other case where I can use the ideal gas law is if my temperature is very high compared to my critical temperature. Right? You see, as we get higher in critical temperature, this dip that takes us away from one gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And if I'm twice the critical temperature, then I have a compressibility factor that's always around one. Right? And this is the thing. So if we're talking about oxygen, right, its critical temperature is going to be really low. So here on Earth, when we have, you know, kind of the temperatures that you'd see in the environment, we're usually going to be much higher than the critical temperature. So we can apply this ideal gas law. And if we use the ideal gas law in this class, we're going to typically use not the versions with the bars over it, because we're going to define the mass as something like kilograms, right? Or how much stuff we have as kilograms or pounds instead of moles, right? So we'll use this version of the ideal gas law. Pressure times specific volume is equal to the specific gas constant times the temperature, right? Again, pressure and temperature here are absolute pressure and absolute temperature, right? Or if we know the mass, then we can also use pressure times volume is equal to the mass times the specific gas constant times the temperature. So those are kind of the versions of the ideal gas law that we'll typically use in this class. And what's cool is that if we have a um, if we have a closed system, in a closed system the mass is constant. And if there's no chemical reactions that are happening, then let's say we have a piston that's full of oxygen, right? Then if there's no chemical reaction happens, it always is full of oxygen. So that means that the R doesn't change either. So that means that if I have a process that's an that has an ideal gas in it, that's a closed system where M and R are constant, then PV over T is constant. So P1 V1 over T1 is equal to MR, which is also equal to P2V2 over T2. So P1V1 over T1 is equal to P2V2 over T2. And that's sort of a relationship that we'll tend to use as we get into cycles that deal with ideal gas to move from state to state. So we use the bar if we're talking about moles, and we drop the bar if we're talking about mass, right? So like kilograms or pound mass. So in this class, we typically won't use the bar. So if we have a compressibility factor of approximately one, and we talked about cases where that's the case, then we can say we have an ideal gas and we can use this ideal gas law. So we typically we can use ideal gases for things that naturally occur as gases in the environment, right? So we talked about like, if we're talking about oxygen at you know normal environmental temperatures, then we can probably say it's an ideal gas. But steam, we're still pretty close to the vapor dome usually when we're talking about steam. So we can't really use the ideal gas law when we're talking about this water vapor that's just formed because we're too close to the vapor dome, right? So in that case, we have to use the tables like we talked about, I, I think it's table A4, right? Or the, whatever table it is for superheated vapor, right? So for an ideal gas, we have this relationship between PV and T and sometimes as we go from state to state, 
we can use this PV over T is equal to a constant relationship, right? So how do we find things like specific internal energy and specific heat or specific enthalpy, right? So this is kind of the point, right? So it's nice that I can use this to maybe find the specific volume or the temperature if I have the pressure, right? But the cool thing is if I've invoked this ideal gas law, then I can also sometimes anyway, if my, if my temperature differences are kind of low, right? I can also invoke this same idea that we had for solids and for um, incompressible fluids. We can invoke this idea that we could approximate the specific heat as being constant, right? So these definitions are the same as they were for solids and liquids, except here, CV and CP are actually different values. So it really matters when you're talking about ideal gases that you pick the right specific heat, right? And remember, CV goes with delta U, right? Because the V looks a little bit like a U. Or you can remember that CP goes with enthalpy, which is H, right? Because enthalpy ends in P, right? But in for closed systems, we're typically trying to find delta U. So we could rearrange the definition of specific heat at constant volume and we can get this equation if we integrate both sides we get that delta u is going to be cv times delta d provided that this cv is constant right so this equation is true either way but then if we say cv is constant we can pull it out of the integral and we see that delta u is equal to cv times delta t the problem is that in, or the potential problem, is that in reality, CV is not constant. It's a function of temperature. So CV does change with temperature. So what happens here is that as you get a wider difference in temperature between T1 and T2, CV changes more, which means that this assumption gets worse. And that means that your approximation for delta U, if you use this equation, gets worse. So you can use this, it's kind of a back of the envelope type calculation, where you're accepting that there's some error that's involved in doing this, right? And we'll talk about during the example that there's another way that we can look up U on a table. If we're talking about air, we'll use table A22, which we'll talk about. And that's assuming that the air has no uh, water that's in it, right? So, you know, you probably know, you know, if you've been in Rochester in the summertime, that there's this thing called humidity, right? So actual air has some water vapor in it, right? So it turns out that when we talk about air, we'll be talking about dry air in this class. Um, if you take Thermo 2, they'll talk about uh, air with some water vapor in it and how you deal with that in the thermodynamic case, right? It's got an awesome name. They call that psychrometrics. Um, and it's got really scary graphs, really scary looking graphs that are actually not that hard once you learn how to read them, but it's beyond the scope of this class, right? So we'll talk about accurate ways to do this or more accurate ways to do this, but one way to find delta U is CV times delta T, and one way to find delta H is CP times delta T, but we have to recognize that when we use these equations, we've made the assumption that the specific heat is constant with temperature as temperature changes and that's not true but it might be true enough to give you a reasonable answer depending on your application all right so if we're dealing with ideal gases we can invoke these assumptions right so if you're on a test and you write down delta u is equal to cv delta t you have to tell me if you're dealing with a gas that you've made the assumption that this is an ideal gas and you've made the assumption that you're you that the specific heat is constant right and every remember every time we make an assumption really what we're doing with these equations is we're modeling the universe right we're estimating what's going to happen in the universe and every assumption that we make you know we take one you know one step towards a, you know a more cartoonish version of the universe versus the actual universe and sometimes that's okay because we can still get you know useful information right remember we talked about how i think the job of the engineer a lot of times is you know how do i design or improve a process 
with imperfect information, right? And what I mean by imperfect information is we've got to make a whole bunch of assumptions a lot of times to get to a usable model. So as an aside, I think there's a textbook question in here, right? So we know by definition that enthalpy, specific enthalpy, is specific internal energy plus pressure times specific volume. This is just the definition of enthalpy. Now we know if we're talking about an ideal gas, then we know that pressure times specific volume is equal to the specific gas constant times RT. There's a textbook question. I can't remember if it's on the homework or not this year, but I can manipulate this equation, right? Because PV is equal to RT. So for an ideal gas, I know that the specific enthalpy is also equal to the specific internal energy plus the specific gas constant times the temperature. Okay, so we talked about there's this way of approximating delta U for ideal gases if we say CV times delta T, right? So I think like always, right, you know, as, as engineers, as scientists, we should be skeptical, right? So it's kind of like a trust but verify kind of thing. So this is a way that we're going to try to verify this. Right? So this is kind of the handout for today, or the problem we're going to go through today. We're going to try to find the change in specific internal energy for two states. And I believe that this is an ideal gas that's air. And we're told that the specific heat is 0.733 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So let's do this example, right? So the first part, so in part A, Right, so we're going to compare this, right? So in part A, we're going to use the ideal gas law. And so we're going to say this is an ideal gas and the specific heats are constant, right? So if specific heat is constant and it's an ideal gas, then I can say that delta U is CV times delta T. Kind of the neat thing here is that, you know, this is my state table, right? And normally we've been talking about state tables and we would enter the actual specific internal energies here on my state table. But if I invoke this assumption that specific heats are constant, I don't actually care what the individual specific internal energies are. I'm actually never going to find the individual values for little u. I'm only finding the change in little u, but that's fine because that's what the first law is asking me for, is delta u, right? So now let's try to find this. If we use the ideal gas law with constant specific heat, then change in the internal energy, change in specific internal energy, is going to be the specific heat at constant volume, CV, times delta T. The problem tells me what CV is, 0.733 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, and I'm told what the temperatures are. In this case, it doesn't matter that the temperatures are in Kelvin, or in degrees Celsius, because my equation is delta T, right? So I'm going to get the same change in temperature, whether I talk about Kelvin or Celsius, because if I look on a thermometer, the distance between those two lines, one in Kelvin, one in Celsius, is the same, right? So delta T doesn't matter. But if it's uh, if I'm using the ideal gas law where it's a T that stands alone, it's not a delta T, then I have to use Kelvin. I think just as a, um, you know, if you're trying to develop a process where you don't have to think about that kind of stuff, typically if you're talking about ideal gases, it's safest to deal with absolute temperatures all the time. And then you don't have to think about it, right? But here we have two temperatures, both in Kelvin. That's the thing. I guess you got to make sure that if you're, you know, doing this subtraction, you can't have a case where one of the temperatures is in Kelvin and the other is in Celsius. You have to make sure you have the same unit. Right? And we know the specific heat. Here, if I look at my units here, right, I got kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin multiplied by Kelvin. The Kelvins are going to cancel out. I'm left with kilojoules per kilogram, which is good because that's the unit for specific internal energy. And here I find that the change in specific internal energy is just under 200 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Again, I can put this on my state table as kind of a change u2 minus u1, but I'm never going to know the individual specific internal energies with this method. 
that's okay. All I need is the temperature. So now I found delta U for this ideal gas, and it was pretty quick because I knew the specific heats and I kind of invoked this assumption. Now I've also told you that anytime you make an assumption, you know, you gotta be wary because you know your your accuracy goes down. So let's compare this to finding the actual values in this case. So how do we find the actual values? We can, so this is for air, right? So for air, we can go to table A22. And on table A22, we get these ideal gas properties of air. Now the cool thing when we're trying to find properties of ideal gases on these tables is that all we need is one of these values. We Usually we need two independent intensive properties to fix a state. But if we're talking about ideal gases, all I need is one of these values because it's an ideal gas. And we have this relationship between PV and T, right? So here, right, if I know the temperature, I can find the specific internal energy, right? Or if I knew the specific internal energy right away, I could find the temperature, right? And then I can use the ideal gas law if I know the temperature and the pressure to find the specific volume, provided I know what gas it is and I can find the specific gas constant. So here, right, in a case, so here it really matters that my temperatures are in Kelvin because that's what they are on this table, right? You can see that in the header here that the temperature here is in Kelvin, right? So if you had an ideal gas and you, and you had a temperature that was in Celsius, you'd have to remember to convert that here. Right? So my state one, my temperature is 293 Kelvin. Now that's not a row on my table, but that's fine. I know how to interpolate. So I can interpolate here between 206.9 and 210.5, right? I've gone three out of the five degrees here. So I'm closer to 210.5, right? I have specific internal energy of 209.06 if I did my interpolation correctly, right? So you, you see here, I'm finding the actual values of the specific internal energy here. My second state is at 564, right? So again, it's an ideal gas and it's air, which means I can use table A22. My temperature is 564, which is between 560 and 570. So now I can look up what values my value of U is in between, and I can do my interpolation just like we've been doing. I'm interpolating with temperature. I find my interpolation factor, and here I got that my U2 value is 407.4. So now, if I'm actually doing a first law problem, I'd want to know delta U. So now I'd look at my state table. I have two values, U2 and U1. I can subtract the two, and in this case, I get 198.4. Right? So this is more accurate than this. But you can see the difference here is very small, right? So here, if I'm trying to find the error, right, epsilon, then, you know, in this case, it's like 0.1%. So for ideal gases, this approximation of CV delta T is equal to delta U is pretty good, provided your temperature differences are relatively small. The larger your temperature difference gets, the worse this assumption gets, right? But it's still going to be reasonable, right? But you know, you gotta, you know, you always gotta remember that the math isn't the right answer, right? The math is a model that's trying to predict what's gonna happen in the universe, right? So the model can give us some understanding, but it's not like the answer is the right answer, right? It's just kind of a prediction of what's gonna happen in the universe. So that was all that I wanted to talk about today. Does anyone have any questions about the content or just about the course in general? All right, we are getting close to the end of the first section of this class which means we will have a midterm coming up. I'm still sort of deciding when exactly we should have the midterm. Uh, because the summer semester is a little bit compressed, um, we will still have homeworks due. So I'm trying to decide uh, when we should have the homework. So if you have, uh, or when we should have the midterm.
So I should have an answer for you at the beginning of next week when we will have uh, our scheduled midterm. So if you have any questions over the weekend, uh, feel free to send me an email. If not, I will have office hours at 10 o'clock and at 3 o'clock on Monday, and I will see you then. Thanks for your time, everyone. Um, I actually have a quick question. Shoot. What's the range we can expect for the midterm to be in? Like, is it like in a week or two or? I think it will either be at the end of next week or the beginning mm -hmm. of the week after. I'm leaning okay. a little bit towards the beginning of the week after so that you'll have finished kind of the last. I think the homework set for next week will include some stuff that's on the midterm. So I think it will probably be the beginning of the week after. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I also had a question for when I looked in the gradebook in my courses, what are the instructor meeting weeks? Oh, uh, like, so that's those? what we've done when this class is so I've set that category to zero on the grading scheme. Um, what we've done when we've met on campus is that for the first couple, I think the first three or four weeks in the class, you have to come to office hours physically uh, twice, maybe in the first three or four weeks. Obviously, you can't physically come to my house to, uh, you know, to talk about thermal. So I, I, we're not going to have that um, that grade affect your final grade. So I've set that to zero in the grading scheme, but I've preserved it in the grade book because I'll probably end up migrating this class over. So it's it's there. You'll see it on the um, you'll see it in the grade book, but it it doesn't impact your grade. Okay, and for the um, the exam, will it be all at, Will we all be taking it at the same time? Or will it be like a take home? I think because we have different people in different time zones, we probably won't all be taking it at the same time. I think it will look something like a take home exam, but I am not exactly sure the duration I will give you for the exam, but it will probably be longer than the typical, well, it will definitely be longer than the typical hour and a half. Um, I think it will probably be more like, you know, an evening where you, uh, you know, so, so you maybe don't have as much stress involved with sort of accessing the material and uploading the material but it probably won't be longer than 24 hours. Okay, that's all my questions. Thank you. You're welcome.